Constitution is fixed when it's adopted, it can be changed only by a constitutional amendment. So for a justice who sees himself or herself as an originalist, the text of Article I of the Constitution that deals with congressional powers means the same thing today as it was adopted in 1787. The First Amendment about freedom of speech means the same thing now as when it was ratified in 1791. The Fourteenth Amendment and its protections of due process and equal protection means the same thing was adopted in 1868. What I want to do today is develop four points for you. First, I want to talk about how we got here with regard to the current Supreme Court. Second, I want to talk about what it's likely to mean. Third, I want to discuss the philosophy of originalism and show you, in the words of the title of a new book I have coming out in the fall, that it really is worse than nothing, that it's a very dangerous form of constitutional interpretation. And then fourth, I want to talk about where do we go from here? What can we as citizens, as lawyers, as law professors do about this. So let me start with, how do we get here? The current Supreme Court has six conservative justices, all appointed by Republican presidents, and three liberal justices appointed by Democratic presidents. That's unique in American history. Until recently, we had liberal justices who were appointed by Republican presidents, think in this regard of John Paul Stevens or David Souter. And we've had conservative justices appointed by Democratic presidents. Think of Byron White or before that, Felix Frankfurter. But now the ideology of the justices exactly corresponds to the political party of the president who appointed them. Well, how did this come to be? In 1968, Richard Nixon ran for president, largely campaigning against the liberalism of the Warren Court. He said that he was going to point strict constructionists who are committed to law and order. He was able to appoint four justices to the Supreme Court in his first two years as president. After Ronald Reagan was inaugurated in January of 1981, he gave a speech where he said he was going to appoint conservatives to the Supreme Court in the lower federal courts. He was able to appoint three justices to the court and also to elevate William Rehnquist from associate to chief justice. In 2016, Donald Trump ran for president saying that he would appoint justices committed to overruling Roe versus Wade. He was able to appoint three justices in his four years as president. To put this in some context, between 1960 and 2020, there were 32 years with a Republican president and 28 years with a Democratic president, almost even. In fact, in 2024, we had 32 years with a Republican president and 32 years with a Democratic president. But between 1960 and 2020, Republican presidents picked 15 Supreme Court justices and Democratic presidents picked only eight Supreme Court justices. Or to put this another way, as I mentioned, Donald Trump picked three justices in four years. But the last three Democratic presidents, Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, served a total of 20 years in the White House. And in those 20 years, they picked only four justices for the Supreme Court. Now, I described the current court as six conservatives and three liberals. And there's no doubt that's true. But they're actually more along an ideological continuum. There are five justices who I would describe as staunch conservatives. Clarence Thomas, Samuel Alito, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, Amy Coney Barrett. John Roberts is certainly to the right of center, but more of a moderate conservative. And on the other side of the ideological spectrum, Stephen Breyer, Elena Kagan, I think was more moderate liberals. I think Sonia Sotomayor is a more staunch liberal, as was Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg before her death. As you know, Stephen Breyer is announced he'll be retiring at the end of this term. Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson has been appointed to replace him. The hearings began today in Washington. The reality is that Judge Jackson's confirmation, which seems likely, is not going to change the overall ideological composition of the court. It will remain six to three. I certainly think that there are cases where her presence, her life experiences, might influence the other justices. But justices serve a long time. And her effect might not be found in 2023 or 2024, but what about in 2040 or 2050? After all, she's only 51 years old.
to put this in another way, Amy Coney Barrett was 49 years old when she was sworn in on October 26, 2020. If she remains on the court until she's 87, the age with Justice Ginsburg died, she'll be a justice until the year 2059. When she was sworn in on October 26, 2020, Neil Gorsuch was 53, Brett Kavanaugh, 55, John Roberts, 65, Samuel Alito, 70, Clarence Thomas, 72. I've long thought that the best predictor of a long lifespan is being confirmed for a seat on the United States Supreme Court. <laughs> so it's easy to imagine five or six of these conservative justices being together for the next decade or two. Well, this brings me to the second part I want to talk about. What's it likely to mean to have this conservative majority? Why did I say at the beginning that I think we're on the verge of a dramatic change in constitutional law like that which we last saw in 1937? Well, think for a moment about the kind of issues that separate liberals and conservatives in our society. I think we'd immediately agree to issues like abortion rights, gun rights, separation of church and state. What I want to say tonight to you is that with regard to each of these three areas, we're likely in just the next few months, between now and the end of June 2022, to see radical changes in the law. Let me start with abortion. As you know, in 1973, in Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court held that the government cannot prohibit abortions prior to viability, the time at which the fetus can survive outside the womb. In 1992, in Planned Parenthood v. Casey, the Supreme Court said it was reaffirming, quote, the essential holding of Roe v. Wade, that states can't prohibit abortions prior to viability. Science and medicine tell us that viability is about the 23rd or 24th week of pregnancy. On September 1st, a Texas law went into effect that prohibits abortions at the sixth week of pregnancy, a time before many women even know that they're pregnant. Challengers, a reproductive health facility, Whole Women's Health, went to the Supreme Court for a preliminary injunction to stop the law from going into effect as was scheduled to at midnight on September 1st. On that evening, the justices ruled five to four against a preliminary injunction and allowed the Texas law to go into effect. There's no doubt that the Texas law is inconsistent with Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey. The law remains under the Constitution that women have the right to an abortion until viability, the 23rd or 24th week of pregnancy. But since September 1st, and we're now at March 21st, that Texas law has been in effect. Several times since, there have been requests to the Supreme Court to issue an injunction to stop the law from being implemented. But time and again, the court has ruled five to four to allow the Texas law to remain in effect. The five and the majority in each instance were Justices Thomas, Alito, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett. Chief Justice Roberts joined the liberal justices in each of these instances in dissent. There's a case on the Supreme Court's docket right now. It was argued on December 1st of 2021, Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health. It involves a Mississippi law that prohibits abortions after the 15th week of pregnancy. Again, that would be inconsistent with Roe and Casey. But it's clear from the oral argument that there are six justices to uphold the Mississippi law. Question is, how is the Supreme Court going to do this? Based on the oral argument, it seems that what Chief Justice Roberts would like to do is uphold the Mississippi law, but leave open the question of whether states can prohibit abortion even earlier, like the Texas law that does it the sixth week of pregnancy, or the Alabama law that prohibits abortions from the moment of conception. But I think there are five justices on the court Thomas, Alito, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett, who want to overrule Roe v. Wade. Thomas, Alito, and Gorsuch are already on record saying they want to do that. At the oral argument, Justice Kavanaugh several times said that he believes that the issue of abortion should be left to the political process. 
Justice Barrett said twice at the oral argument that laws that prohibit abortion are not a burden on women because women can give birth and put the children up for adoption. I think the comments of Kavanaugh and Barrett indicate that they, like the three other justices I mentioned, will vote to overrule Roe versus Wade. I think the court allowing the Texas law to remain in effect since September 1st is a clear indication of what is likely to happen. Quickly, about half the states in the country will prohibit all or almost all abortions. Many states already have laws on the books to do this. Of course, women with resources will travel to states where abortion is legal. Before New York became the first state in this country to legalize abortion, 25% of the abortions in England were performed on American women. It wasn't poor women who were traveling to England for abortions. But the Supreme Court overruling Roe is not going to eliminate the political controversy over abortion. Just two weeks ago, a bill was introduced in the Missouri legislature to make it a crime for women to go out of state to have an abortion. I predict the next time there's a Republican president or Republican Congress, they'll try to adopt a federal statute prohibiting all abortions in the United States. And so the issue of abortion remains salient in political races and judicial races all over the country. Second example that I gave is with regard to gun rights. From 1791, when the Second Amendment was adopted, until June of 2008, not one federal, state, or local law regulating guns was declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. In the handful of Supreme Court cases about gun rights, the Supreme Court always said, the Second Amendment means what it says. It's a right to have guns for the purpose of militia service. The Second Amendment says that a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. In June of 2008, the Supreme Court, for the first time in history, struck down a law regulating firearms. The case was District of Columbia versus Heller and involved a 35-year-old DC ordinance that prohibited ownership or possession of handguns. The decision was five to four. It was split along ideological lines. Justice Scalia wrote the majority opinion for the conservative justice on the court. Justices Stevens and Breyer wrote dissenting opinions joined by the other liberal justices. And Justice Scalia said, the Second Amendment protects the right of people to have guns in their homes for the sake of security. But that's as far as the Supreme Court went. That was 14 years ago. The Supreme Court has not decided another case but the scope of the Second Amendment ever since. But there's a case on the Supreme Court's docket now, New York Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin, which was argued on November 3rd in the Supreme Court. It involves a New York law that prohibits having a concealed weapon in public unless a person has a concealed weapons permit. This New York statute is over 100 years old. To get a concealed weapons permit, a person needs to show a safety need for possessing a concealed weapon. Challenge was brought to the New York statute. The Federal District Court in New York upheld the New York law. The United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit upheld the New York law. And now it's before the Supreme Court. From the oral argument, it's clear, clear to me that it's going to be a six to three decision to declare the New York law unconstitutional. And I think the Supreme Court for the first time in history is going to say that there is a Second Amendment right to have guns in public, including concealed weapons. Now what the court will allow in terms of regulating concealed weapons, we'll need to wait and see. But this will have the fact of striking down laws in many states across the country, including my home state of California. Third example that I want to talk about concerns religion and separation of church and state. Here too, there are matters before the court that are likely to bring about a dramatic change in the law. Let me give you two examples of cases before the court. One is Carson versus Macon, which was argued on December 10th of 2021. There are parts of the state of Maine that are too rural to support public schools. So in those areas, there are school administrative units that provide funds to parents 
to send their children to private school. Maine requires that this money be used for secular private schools. The statute prohibits the money from being used in, quote, sectarian schools. There's about 5,000 children that are affected by this. Maine says its goal is to provide a free secular education for every child in the state. Maine says it doesn't want to use taxpayer dollars to support the religions of others. Two religious schools and two parents have brought a challenge to this. They argue that if the government is going to allow the money to be used in secular private schools, free exercise of religion requires that the money be able to be used in religious schools as well. In other words, their claim is that whenever the government provides funds that would support private secular education, free exercise of religion requires that that money be used for religious education as well. I predict, based on the oral argument, that the Supreme Court is going to rule against the state of Maine and in favor of the challengers. I think the Supreme Court is going to broadly say that the First Amendment and free exercise of religion require the government to provide assistance to religious schools when it's providing it to secular schools. This is such a dramatic change in the law. For decades, the issue before the Supreme Court and the lower courts is when may the government give aid to religious schools without that violating the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment? And there are cases about whether the government could provide things like audiovisual equipment, computers, buses for field trips, sign language interpreters to religious schools without that violating the Establishment Clause. Now the issue is when must the government give aid to religious schools or it violates free exercise? This, too, isn't going to end the litigation. Think of charter schools. Throughout the country, public school systems fund charter schools, but have always required that the charter schools be secular. The next litigation to come about is going to be whether or not the government has to fund religious charter schools as well. And there's another case that's going to be argued in the Supreme Court on April 25th. All the other cases I've mentioned have already been argued. But Kennedy versus Bremerton schools will be argued next month. Joseph Kennedy was a high school football coach in Bremerton, Washington. At the end of football games, he would go on to the 50-yard line and kneel and pray. He then began to be joined by his players who would come with him, and sometimes players from the other team. One parent complained. He said his son felt that unless he joined the prayers, he wouldn't get as much playing time and he said his family were atheists. The school district ordered the teacher to stop engaging in prayer on the 50-yard line with the players after games. The Supreme Court has ruled since the early 1960s that prayer in public schools, even so-called voluntary prayer, violates the Constitution. Joseph Kennedy briefly ceased his prayer, and then, in violation of the orders that had been given him, began after the games not only holding prayers but giving motivational speeches that were overtly religious where he had the players from both teams join him. He was fired for doing this and he brought a lawsuit and said it violated his free speech and his free exercise religion to not allow him to pray in this way after football games. Of course, any restriction on prayer in schools limits the speech of the teachers and students who want to pray. But the Supreme Court has said that in the public school context, prayer is inherently coercive. In fact, 22 years ago, in 2000, in Santa Fe Independent School District versus Doe, the Supreme Court declared unconstitutional student-led prayers at high school football games. The court talked about how prayer should be in the private realm, that in the public sphere like this, it's inherently coercive. The case hasn't been argued but many believe that the court is likely to side with the football coach. Well, I picked several examples of just what's before the Supreme Court this term. And if the court comes out, as I suggest, I think you're going to see the radical changes in constitutional law that I alluded to in my introduction. Well, this then brings me to the third part of my remarks. What's animating this change in constitutional law? Now, for a long time, conservatives railed against liberal judicial activism. And you still hear that rhetoric a lot. 
In fact, you'll hear it a lot during the confirmation hearings of Judge Jackson this week. I'm never sure what the phrase judicial activism means. I've long thought it refers to the decisions we don't like. We call them activist decisions. But if activism has any principled content, I think we'd agree that the court is activist if it's overturning laws and government practices, and more restrained if it's upholding government actions and practices. The court is activist if it's overruling precedent and restrained if it's following precedent. The court is activist if it rules broadly, restrained if it rules narrowly. That doesn't tell us that activism is necessarily bad. Brown versus Board of Education was tremendously activist, but it was imperative. But what's interesting about every example I gave you is that by any definition of activism, those are activist decisions. Overruling Roe versus Wade, a precedent that's 49 years old, or take, for example, guns striking down a New York statute that's over 100 years old, or the Artists of Christian Church ruling that Maine can't limit its aid to secular schools, or overruling decades of cases with regard to prayer in public schools. What I want to suggest to you that a great deal of what's animating this is the originalist judicial philosophy that I mentioned in my introduction. At least three of the justices on the current court, Justices Thomas, Gorsuch, and Barrett, are self-avowed originalists. And Justice Alito and Kavanaugh often speak in those terms and are quite sympathetic to that. As I said, originalism is the philosophy that the meaning of a constitutional provision is fixed when it's adopted and be changed only by amendment. So what I predict the Supreme Court's going to say in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health is that there's nothing in the Constitution about abortion rights. The original meaning of the Constitution was adopted didn't include abortion rights, so therefore it's illegitimate. I expect what the Supreme Court will say with regard to the Second Amendment is that the framers of the Second Amendment broadly meant to protect a right of people to have guns. The latter language in the Second Amendment, the right of people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And I think they'll say that the framers of the Constitution did not mean to erect a wall that separates church and state, but meant for there to be robust protection of free exercise of religion in the main law where the firing the football coach violate that. Well, what I want to describe to you tonight is the reasons why I believe that originalism is so badly flawed as a constitutional theory. Part of the reason is epistemological. We can't really know what was the original understanding of a constitutional provision that was adopted so long ago. Think about the adoption of the Constitution itself. There were those who were at the Constitutional Convention of Philadelphia in 1787. There were those in the state ratifying conventions. Why believe that there was a single intent that's there to be found? I had the wonderful opportunity, now 25 years ago, of being elected to a commission in Los Angeles to rewrite the city charter. In California, city charter is like the constitution of the city. It creates the institution of city governments. It allocates the power among the branches. It even can provide more protection of rights than exist under federal law or state law. And voters passed an initiative to create an elected commission to draft a new charter that would then go back before the voters for their approval. 15 people were elected in Los Angeles, one from each of the city council districts. I ran for election, one in my council district, and was chosen by my fellow commissioners to be the chair. What I learned was that for anything we passed, there are a variety of different views among the commissioners as to why we did it and what it meant. We would take straw votes and then come back two weeks later and disagree about what we meant. Well, thankfully, our work came to fruition. In June of 1999, the voters of Los Angeles approved our proposed charter by a 60 to 40 margin. Immediately, issues began to arise to interpret particular provisions. And I would get a call from the city attorney's office or from litigants, and they'd say, what did you mean by this provision? And almost always the answer is, we never thought of that question. And then occasionally I'd say, you know, we discussed that, and this is what I thought we'd mean. 
If the lawyer liked my conclusion, the lawyer would say, could you write up a declaration saying that? And if not, the lawyer would keep calling other commissioners until they got somebody who would say what they wanted to say. There was one case litigated very early about the meaning of the term limits provision. Where it was something we never understood. And the court came to a conclusion saying that the voters intended by this provision a certain meaning. This was one line in a hundred page document that went to the voters that was never discussed in the campaign. It was purely a fiction to say there was an intent there that could be discovered. This is of course true of constitutional provisions as well. It's not as if we're ever going to know what the framers of the Constitution, or what the original meaning was for the provisions of the Constitution. But I think there's another problem as well. The framers didn't intend for their views to be controlling. They didn't want there to be an original understanding that would be binding on future generations. Chief Justice John Marshall, who was at the Constitutional Convention said, in the famous case of McCulloch versus Maryland in 1819, Quote, we must never forget that it's a constitution we're expounding. A constitution meant to adapt and endure for ages to come. And of course that's right. James Madison took the only official notes at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787, and he instructed that they not be opened until after his death, which wasn't until in the early 1840s. There was such a strong sense that it was a constitution that should grow that should evolve, or in the words of today, be a living document. In fact, I think this really creates a difficulty for originalists, because if you want to follow originalism, their philosophy was that originalism shouldn't be followed, and thus has to be rejected. <laughs> but there's another problem with original as well, and this is what I call the abhorrence problem. If we really followed originalism, it would lead to abhorrent results in so many areas. Remember, the Constitution was written in 1787 for an agrarian slave society. Even the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment was adopted in 1868 for a world so vastly different than ours today. I can give you a few examples of what I regard as the abhorrence problem. One is that under originalism, Brown versus Board of Education was wrongly decided. The same Congress that voted to ratify the 14th Amendment also voted to segregate the District of Columbia public schools. Brown was first argued in the Supreme Court, was known as October term 1952. The justices could not come to a conclusion, and so they asked the lawyers over the summer of 1953 brief questions about what did the framers of the 14th Amendment mean with regard to segregation, in particular of schools. In the summer of 1953, Chief Justice Fred Vinson died of a heart attack. President Dwight Eisenhower appointed California Governor Earl Warren to be Chief Justice. On May 17, 1954, the court handed out its decision in Brown versus Board of Education. The court did not try to justify its result in terms of the framers' intent or the original meaning of the 14th Amendment. Quite the contrary. Chief Justice Warren, writing for a unanimous court, said, we can't turn the clock back to what the law was or the world was in 1868 or 1787. Today, education is one of the most important things that government provides. And the court said that segregated schools are inherently unequal. But I don't think that any commentator has shown a way to reconcile Brown versus Board of Education with the philosophy of originalism. And I would posit for you that if Brown is illegitimate under a theory, it's a theory you must reject. Well, I'll give you another example. If we're originalists, then the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment doesn't prohibit discrimination except for race discrimination. This was Justice Scalia's position. He believed that the guarantee of equal protection of the law does not stop sex discrimination or discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or anything besides race discrimination. In 1873, in the slaughterhouse cases, the Supreme Court said it was unthinkable to them that the Equal Protection Clause would ever be applied to anything other than race discrimination. And in fact, just shortly thereafter, in a case called Minor v. Hepperset, coming from Missouri, the Supreme Court said it was constitutional to exclude women from voting. The Equal Protection Clause wasn't meant to protect women from discrimination. It wasn't until 1971 
that the Supreme Court for the first time found sex discrimination to violate the Constitution. It wasn't until 1996 that the court for the first time found that sexual orientation discrimination violates the Constitution. But if you're originalist then, equal protection provides no limits with regard to discrimination. But take the First Amendment and freedom of speech. It's clear that the framers of the First Amendment thought that the government could prohibit blasphemous expression, taking the Lord's name in vain. They believed that the government could prohibit seditious libel. They passed a law, the Alien and Sedition Act. They made it a federal crime to falsely criticize government or government officials. Speech mild than what you hear on TV talk shows on a daily basis was prohibited and punished by incarceration. We wouldn't accept that today, but under originalism, it would be permissible. And of course, this is closely related to what I would call the modernity problem with regard to originalism. How do we go about applying a document that was written in 1787 to current issues that are coming up, technological issues that couldn't have possibly be imagined by the framers? There was a Supreme Court case about a decade ago, Brown versus Entertainment Merchants, that involved a California law that made it a crime to sell or rent violent video games to minors under 18. At the oral argument, Justice Scalia was then on the bench, engaged in a long exchange with the lawyer for the challenger. Finally, Justice Alito interceded and said, really what Justice Scalia wants to know is, what did James Madison think about violent video games? <laughs> Merely to ask that question shows the absurdity of it. Or think of the other issues that come before the Supreme Court now. When can the government regulate speech over social media? Or the Supreme Court case a few years ago about can the police take DNA from somebody to see if it matches an unsolved crime in the police database? Or another case a few years ago, does it violate the Fourth Amendment for the police to obtain cellular location information these are the records our cell phone companies have of where we are based on our cell phones connecting to cellular towers. Again, it's absurd to even ask the question what the framers thought. But maybe most important, what I want to suggest to you tonight, is that the justice who are originalists are quick to abandon originalism when it doesn't get to the conservative results that they want. Let me give you an important example here and relates to some cases that are going to be before the Supreme Court next October. Concerns affirmative action. Now, as you can tell from what I've said tonight, I don't believe we can really ever know what the framers of a particular provision meant, and we really shouldn't be applying their views to our modern situation. But if ever we can know what the framers of the Constitution wanted, I think it would be with regard to affirmative action. The same Congress that ratified the 14th Amendment in 1868 adopted many race-conscious programs, like say the Freedmen's Bureau, that today we would describe as affirmative action. And yet what you find is that the conservative justices on the court, Justice Scalia when he was there, Justice Thomas, the justices who most described themselves as originalists completely ignored that original understanding. The Supreme Court in a series of decisions has held that college universities may engage in affirmative action. They may use race as one factor in admissions decisions to benefit minorities and enhance diversity. The court said this in Regents, the University of California versus Bakke in 1978, Grutter versus Bollinger in 2003, Fisher versus Texas Austin in 2016. In each one of these cases, the originalist justices on the court strongly dissented and objected to affirmative action. There wasn't a word in their dissenting opinions with regard to the original meaning and understanding of the 14th Amendment with regard to affirmative action. The Supreme Court has granted review for two cases next October, Students for Fair Admission versus University of North Carolina and Students for Fair Admission versus Harvard, on whether to overrule those precedents that I mentioned. I have no doubt that the Supreme Court 6-3 to three, is going to overrule those precedents and hold that college universities can't engage in affirmative action. I predict you will not see a word in those opinions about originalism, original understanding. The reality is the conservative justices are quick to abandon originalism what doesn't get to the results that they want. Well, this then brings me to 
fourth and final part of my remarks. What is it that we, as citizens, as lawyers, as law professors can do? I think some of the answer to this is the importance of articulating an alternative vision of constitutional law. Justice Scalia was fond of defending originalism by saying, I have a theory, you don't, and something is better than nothing. That's why I've titled my new book on originalism, Worse Than Nothing, in describing <laughs> originalism. I once heard Justice Scalia speak at an audience of law students, and one of the students said to Justice Scalia, the question was, um, how do you explain Brown versus Board of Education on your originalist theory? Justice Scalia responded, and I can still quote his reply word for word, a broken clock gets it right twice a day. Next question. <laughs> well, I think what those who aren't originalists need to do is explain that the Supreme Court has never been originalist through American history. That the Supreme Court has always considered a multiplicity of sources. It always starts with the text of the Constitution. It always considers what we can learn about original understanding and framers' intent. It looks to tradition. It looks to precedent. It looks to modern social needs. That's what constitutional interpretation should always be about. But I think it's important to defend this alternative vision of the Constitution. And yet, just today, Senator Grassley said he wants only to confirm justice for the court who are committed to following the original meaning of the Constitution. And you'll hear a lot of that from Republican senators this week. I think second, it's going to be important to look to alternative forums apart from the Supreme Court, to advance liberty and equality. I tried to show you earlier that the composition of the Supreme Court ideologically is unlikely to change for the next decade or two. And so one of the things that I think is going to be important for lawyers who want to advance freedom and equality is go to other venues. Sometimes this will be going to state courts. State courts can always protect more rights under state constitutions than the United States Supreme Court finds under the United States Constitution. Sometimes it's going to be using the political process to do this. After the death of George Floyd, many cities adopted laws that prohibit police from using chokeholds, even though the Supreme Court refused to find them unconstitutional. California adopted a law changing the legal standard for what's excess of police force, saying deadly force must be necessary, not just reasonable the political process providing more protection of rights. But I also think it's really important for those of us who are perhaps more experienced in our career to continue to instill faith and optimism in the system in our students, in younger lawyers, and those throughout society. I've been a law professor for 42 years now. I've never seen my students especially my progressive students, more discouraged than they are right now. And I believe that I have an obligation as a law professor to instill faith and hope in them, but it can't be a false hope. What I try to tell them, and I will conclude my class in constitutional law this semester with these words, is that we really only have two choices. We either give up or we fight harder which means that we only have one choice to fight harder and better than we have before. And we can take hope from history. The sweep of American history has been tremendous advancements with our equality and freedom. Think of race. There's still enormous racial discrimination and racial inequality in our society. But compared to what it was in 1787 when the Constitution was written, and protected the institution of slavery, or 1868, when the 14th was adopted, even 1953, the year that I was born, at that time, every southern state still had laws that required separation of the races in all aspects of life. Or I can tell my students to think of this with regard to gender equality. The law school that I attended in 1970, only 5% of the earning law students were women. When I was a first year law student, 25% were women. But today at the law school where I'm dean, University of California, Berkeley, two thirds of the entering students are women. 
Or think about it with regard to sexual orientation. It's not quite seven years ago, on June 26, 2015, that the court in Obergefell versus Hodges held that state laws that prohibit marriage equality for gays and lesbians are unconstitutional. And so ultimately my message to my students, to others, is that the day, late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. got it exactly right when he said, the arc of the moral universe is long and it bends towards justice. Thank you. <laughs> so um, here are a few ground rules. Uh, there are microphones on either side, and so if you'll wait until I recognize you uh, for your question, that would be great. And of course, we want to have uh, civil uh, uh, dialogue here, and so I just you know, ask you to follow the, the same uh, do as you would have others do to you, right, as your mama taught you. Um, in our questioning so that we can have a real engaged uh, dialogue. So I'll get a start, I get the privilege. <laughs> I get to be able to ask a few questions to get us started. Uh, so take me back to my basic con law class where I learned about something called textualism, where the idea was that the Constitution should be interpreted according to what the words in the Constitution say. What's the difference between textualism and originalism, and is, it, does textualism provide more grounding than originalism? All justices, liberal and conservative, believe that everything starts with the text. The problem is that for constitutional issues that are come to the Supreme Court, rarely does the text provide any answer. Take, for example, the Eighth Amendment. What's cruel and unusual punishment? The first case I ever argued in the Supreme Court was a case called Lockyer versus Andrade. And my client, Leandro Andrade, was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole for 50 years for selling $153 worth of videotapes from Kmart stores. He received the sentence under California's Three Strikes Law. He received it even though no one in the history of the country had ever received a life sentence for shoplifting. My argument was, that's cruel and unusual punishment. Now I lost 5-4, the court's split along ideological lines, the point is, how do we determine what's cruel and unusual punishment? Or what's due process of law? Or what's speech within the meaning of the First Amendment? Mm. Is wearing an armband speech? Is picketing speech? The word doesn't tell us the answer. Or go back to the example I mentioned in my talk of the Second Amendment. Start with the text. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state the right of the people to keep in bar arms shall not be infringed. Well, is that just about a right to have guns for militia service? Because that's what the first half says. Or is it as Justice Scalia said, the first half is just prefatory language, and it's only the second half that's the operative language. Those were his exact words. The text isn't going to give us an answer to that. So everyone will start with the text but the text can't provide answers. Or I'll give another simple example. Was it unconstitutional to elect Kamala Harris as vice president? The text of the Constitution refers to the president and vice president with the pronoun he. In fact, the framers of the Constitution only imagined that men would be president and vice president. Does that mean if we're textualists, this unconstitutional elected woman is president and vice president until the Constitution is amended? I can go on with examples. The text so rarely will provide answers for the kind of issues that go to the Supreme Court. And originalists concede that, as do non-originalists. Originalists say, though, interpret the text just to be what the original meaning was of a provision, nothing else until the Constitution is amended. Thank you. That <coughs> I'm ready for the final exam now. Um, so one of the suggestions that you've made is that we find alternative fora. Um, and you've suggested that maybe moving into state constitutions is the place. I'd like to explore that a little bit more because I think that's a fascinating idea. Uh, state constitutions can provide greater rights than f federal uh, the federal constitution, but you also mentioned in the example of abortion 
that the political fight would continue with federal law that might prohibit abortion across all the United States. So just how far can we go with state constitutions before the United States Constitution will be interpreted to limit the right of state constitutions? That was a very convoluted question, but I know sure. you can find your way through it. Where the Supreme Court says there's no right under the U.S. Constitution, a state can find a right under its constitution. Let me give examples so this isn't abstract. The Supreme Court has said that there's no First Amendment right to use privately owned shopping centers for speech purposes. But the California Supreme Court found under the California Constitution a right to use private shopping centers for speech purposes. And the Supreme Court, in a case called Pruneyard Shopping Center versus Robin says, if the state wants to provide more protection of rights, it can do so. Or another example, the Supreme Court has said under the Fourth Amendment, the police searching somebody's garbage doesn't require a warrant or probable cause. The Supreme Court has said the trash that you leave out for the garbage collectors, you don't have any reasonable expectation of privacy with regard to it. But many state courts under their state constitutions have found that it violates state constitutional law for the police to search somebody's garbage without a warrant or probable cause. And so where the Supreme Court says there's no right, states can provide rights. So when Roe versus Wade is overruled, as I predict it will be, states like California and New York will continue to allow abortions and other states will prohibit abortions. Now, what I've said is states can do so unless there is federal preemption. So if Congress wants to pass a law, assuming it has the power under the Constitution to do so, that says we're prohibiting all abortions in the United States, that then would take that authority away from states and state constitutions that would preempt state law. And I think there's a real chance if Roe is overruled, the next time there's a Republican president, Republican Congress, they will try to do that. I think there's also the chance that if there's a Democratic president, Democratic Congress, they would try to create a national law establishing a national right to abortion, but I don't foresee that being able to get past a Republican filibuster. It, it strikes me as you're, as you're explaining that We've got kind of a, a similar little laboratory going with uh, marijuana, right? With states that have legalized marijuana, mm -hmm. but still on the federal level, it's illegal. It, it would be fascinating to see where that particular tug of war goes. Right. And it, it really does get to the issue of when does federal law, in the technical term, is preempt state and local law. If there's a conflict between federal law and state or local law, the federal law wins out. The example that I always give to my students is um, federal law says that only the Department of Agriculture can prescribe grades and labels for meat. Well, states then can't prescribe grades and labels for meat. The, the, there's a, a, a conflict there. Um, with regard to marijuana, the Controlled Substance Act makes marijuana a Schedule One controlled substance, but states like California legalize marijuana. Well, the reason they can do that is that the state doesn't have to have a law that prohibits marijuana. The federal government can enforce its marijuana law against people in California. But if California doesn't want to have a law, there's nothing that requires it to have a law. Um, sometimes we say that federal law preempts state law if the federal law is meant to wholly occupy the field. Um, immigration law is an example. That states can't have their own immigration law. But there's no indication of that with regard to marijuana. So the difference is the state can't prevent the federal government from enforcing federal marijuana law. But the state doesn't have to have a law if it doesn't want to. And so that's why it's a different situation. Sure. I have two questions. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Sure. Oh, and if questions. you could do them one at a time, it's easier yeah. for me. Okay. Um, they're actually both pretty simple, although you both might want to answer the first one, which is I'm picking off your question or your comment about the uh, lack of enthusiasm of your law school students, their depression even going into the field. And I just read yesterday, and I think it was an inside higher ed, but I'm not, I, don't quote me on that, where law school applications are up again. And it's been a roller coaster ride. Last time you and I got together, 
I mean, many years ago, law school, everybody was going to law school no matter what. What's behind that at this point? Then the second question is, could you tell me a little bit more about your thoughts on John Roberts? I find him a fascinating jurist at this point. Sure. Let's do, as to the first, I don't know what's happening with your applications in the last couple of years. We, we also have experienced an increase in applications. Um, and who knows? Uh, at, f around here at UMKC, for a while, we used to say all our students are going to pharmacy school instead. Now the pharmacy applications are beginning to decline, so I think it's just people have learned that pharmacy isn't as fun as law, and so they've come back to law school. So, <laughs> I, you know, knowing what is in the minds of, and and I teach them, I teach undergraduates uh, pre-law classes, and and why, you know, the reasons why they're applying and why they're coming to law school really haven't changed a lot over the 35, 40 years I've been teaching law school. It's just there's more, more of them right now. Might be, might be that mm -hmm. some, some have called it the Trump bump, you know, yeah. that after, after folks have seen the role of lawyers in protecting individual rights, especially after immigration changes in the law. But I don't know, what do you think, Dean? Um, I think it's cyclical and it's difficult to predict why it goes up and down the way that it does. Uh, there was a tremendous increase after the recession in 2008, 2009, then a dramatic decrease. And then last year there was a huge increase, according to the statistics from the Law School Admissions Council, this year it's a bit down compared to last year, but still much higher than it was two or three years ago. Um, Maybe it is students who are going to school for the reasons that you say. Um, maybe it's just cyclical in terms of um, what people want to do at any point in time. Um, I like it better when more people want to go to law school. It's, uh, <laughs> we, I think our country desperately needs more good lawyers, so uh, I, I favor that, but um, I don't have any great theory as to that. In terms of John Roberts, I think he is a really interesting figure as well. There's, I think the best biography I've written about him is by Joan Piskubik, who writes for CNN and does CNN Live uh, broadcast, and it's called The Chief. And I think it's a very nuanced biography and I highly recommend it. Um, what you get from the book is that John Roberts is today who he's been, not just in his time on the court, but his whole life. He's been a Republican his whole life. He's right of center but he's never been far right of center. And so there's always been a difference between him on the court and say a Scalia or a Thomas. Don't forget in 2012, he was the decisive vote to uphold the Affordable Care Act. The National Federation of Business for Sibelius, it was five to four with Roberts joining Ginsburg, Breyerson, and Kagan to uphold the Affordable Care Act. And yet if you look overall at his voting record, he votes with the conservatives far more than he votes with the liberals. Um, he also, I think, more than perhaps some of his colleagues, really cares about the institutional legitimacy of the court. And he is an incrementalist, uh, minimalist, wanting to go in small steps, not dramatic changes. And I could give you many examples where the conservatives have wanted to come to a more dramatic change, and he's wanted to steer a more moderate course. There was a case last June, Fulton versus City of Philadelphia, but the law of the free exercise clause, something I talked about. And Justice Salito, Thomas, and Gorsuch wanted to overrule a 30-year-old precedent, he wanted to dramatically change the law. Roberts got the majority, and he moved the law slightly further to the right, but not nearly as much as they did. And I think that's because he's very concerned about the legitimacy of the court. I think in Dobbs, the abortion case, he liked the court to uphold the Mississippi law but not explicitly right now overrule Roe versus Wade, or express views on what about abortion laws that prohibit abortion before the 15th week of pregnancy. I don't think he's got five votes though. I think that it's much more likely the five conservatives want to go all the way to overruling Roe. So he's a fascinating figure, but I do recommend um, John Piscubic's book. Good evening, I'm Alan Roster and I'm a law professor here at UMKC and Hi. I teach constitutional law among other things. So I'm interested in what you have to say about it, of course. So thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, my question kind of follows up on what you were just saying that you know, John Roberts is a little more complex but there's five other very conservative, seemingly very conservative Supreme Court justices. 
do you think there's anything that might moderate how far they will take things? You know, in the past, usually the Supreme Court hasn't defied a strong national consensus on things for too long. You know, could it be different this time? In the past, for example, sometimes there were justices who turned out to be less conservative than they were expected to be. Is there any chance of that happening now? If not, why not? And, and is, it also, is it possible there could be such a backlash? If, is there any chance the Supreme Court goes so far with the cases you're talking about or others to the point that there's really some kind of pushback that moderates what they'll do? Those are wonderful questions. Let me try to break it down because there's several things in what you ask. One is, is it possible that some of the justices might change ideologically? It's happened at times in American history. Harry Blackman, who went on the Supreme Court in 1969, was initially very conservative, but by the time he retired from the court in 1994, he was the among, if not the most liberal justice on the court. Everyone thought Felix Frankfurter was going to be very liberal, and when he retired, he was the most conservative justice then on the Supreme Court. But we've also got to recognize that those are the exceptions. Most people don't have major ideological conversions in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. Antonin Scalia went on the Supreme Court very conservative in 1986. He was just as conservative when he passed away in February 2016. Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a liberal when she went on the court in 1993. He was just as liberal when she died in October of 20, September 2020. I think ideological conversions are less likely now than they used to be because ideology is used much more by presidents in choosing nominees. I think for Republicans, the mantra has been no more David Souters, where it wasn't that David Souter changed once he was on the court. No one knew what his ideology was going to be. I was one of the law professors who went back and read all of his decisions when he was Chief Justice in the Hampshire Supreme Court. And my colleague, Bert Newborn, put it best when he said, the only thing you can come with his inclusion is the New Hampshire Supreme Court had a really boring docket. <laughs> None of us knew. But now, I mean, President Trump picked three very conservative individuals for the court. I think it's unlikely that Justices Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, Barrett are gonna be different than they were throughout their lives. President Obama picked two liberal justices and Sotomayor and Kagan for the Supreme Court. Um, I don't think Justice Jackson, if she's confirmed, is going to have a major ideological conversion. She is who she is ideologically. It's always possible. Now, it may be that Justice Kavanaugh will join with Chief Justice Roberts in moderating how far right the court goes. And there are instances where Kavanaugh has joined with Roberts in that regard. Just in uh, a couple of months ago, when the Supreme Court upheld one of the vaccine mandates, it wasn't a constitutional case, but the vaccine mandate by Health and Human Services for health workers, Kavanaugh joined with Roberts and the three liberal justices. So that might happen. Um, Kavanaugh's not an originalist in the same way that Barrett is an originalist. So maybe you'll see it in that regard. But I think both Democratic and Republican presidents are using ideology much more as a litmus test than they used to. Um, you know, think about it. Dwight Eisenhower, a Republican president, could pick a Democrat, William Brennan, for the Supreme Court. We're not going to see that again, not in the foreseeable future. Um, could there be a backlash? The reality is yes. Um, a Gallup poll this past fall showed that the Supreme Court had the lowest approval ratings of at any time since these have been measured. It had 40% approval and 53% disapproval. Two thirds of those polled in another Gallup poll in the fall said Roe versus Wade shouldn't be overruled. What will overruling Roe versus Wade mean for the Supreme Court's legitimacy? As you know so well, and as I alluded to in my introduction, there was a real legitimacy crisis for the Supreme Court in 1936 that helped think lead to the change in 1937. Might there be a legitimacy crisis that will affect the court? Um, Justice Sotomayor referred to this explicitly at the oral argument in Dobbs versus Jackson Health, which she spoke in, I'm quoting her exact word, the stench that would come from the court overruling Roe because of a perceived political views of those on the court. I don't know if she's right, but, and I don't know what form the backlash will take. I don't know what effect it will have on the justices, um, but it's certainly possible. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your predictions on those several cases here that you discussed. I was wondering if I could just ask you to make a few more predictions. One is um, the, uh, is MAP versus Ohio. Is there a sure. vehicle coming up before the U.S. Supreme Court? Maybe I don't see any blockbuster criminal law cases this year, but sure. coming up before the U.S. Supreme Court to overrule MAP in terms of the exclusionary rule as well sure. as the incorporation? Don okay. Um, MAP versus Ohio was a 1961 Supreme Court decision that said that if state and local police engage in searches that violate the Fourth Amendment, the evidence obtained has to be excluded. In 1914, the Supreme Court said, if the federal law enforcement violates the Constitution, the evidence has to be excluded. And it was in 1961 that the Supreme Court said that this applies to state and local police as well, or to use the word you did, that it's incorporated against state and local governments. The question is, might the Supreme Court overrule the exclusionary rule? I'll give you a yes and a no, which is the Typical law professor answer. <laughs> yes, I could imagine it happening because conservatives have long opposed the exclusionary rule. In 2006, in Hudson versus Michigan, Justice Scalia wrote an opinion calling for the elimination of the exclusionary rule. Justice Scalia's opinion was joined by Chief Justice Roberts, Justice Thomas, and Justice Alito. It was a 5-4 decision. Justice Kennedy wrote a concurring opinion saying, quote, the continued operation of the exclusionary rule is not in doubt. Well, the court's much more conservative than it was in 2006. And conservatives have long opposed the exclusionary rule, believing it lets dangerous people go free. So might there then be, in some case, the Supreme Court overruling the exclusionary rule? The no part of it is that the Supreme Court since then has narrowed the exclusionary rule so much they may not feel the need to overrule it. There was a case in 2009, Herring versus the United States, where the Supreme Court said the exclusionary rule doesn't apply if police violate the Fourth Amendment in good faith or negligently. It applies only if the police do so recklessly or intentionally. That gives judges a lot of latitude to let evidence in by saying, oh, the police made a mistake in how they engaged in the search, they didn't have a warrant, they didn't have probable cause. But it was just negligent, let the evidence in. And so, that change and other changes with regard to the exclusionary rule might mean that the conservatives feel less need to overrule it. Interestingly, there are no Fourth Amendment cases on the Supreme Court's docket this term. I cannot remember another year when there were no Fourth Amendment cases on the docket. Um, but, so the answer to the question is, maybe. <laughs> Could I ask one more? Yeah, uh, um, there, is a, there is a case on the docket dealing with climate change this yes. year. And I was wondering if you might have an ideological ex explanation for why the court simply didn't accept that it was a moot proposition before it. I sure hope they still do that. The case is West Virginia versus Environmental Protection Agency. And I should disclose, I filed a friend of the court brief, an amicus brief in the case, on behalf of four United States senators, Sheldon Whitehouse being the lead senator um, and my client in the matter. Um, the Biden I'm sorry, the Obama administration adopted a climate protection plan that regulated greenhouse gas emissions from power plants. The Trump administration rescinded the Biden administration plan and adopted its own energy plan that was far more permissive and much less regulatory. The Biden administration has now said it's not going to follow either the Obama plan or the Trump plan, it's going to come up with its own plan, likely in the fall of 2022. Well, this then says to the Supreme Court, there's no plan to be challenged. There's nothing, there's no case or controversy, so the case should be dismissed. And I'm still hopeful that the Supreme Court will dismiss it. Um, my concern is that the conservatives on the court very much want to limit the discretion of administrative agencies and may use this as the case to do so, specifically with regard to the EPA <laughs> and the Clean Air Act. Um, but since there is no current plan, and the government has been clear it's not following any plan, it doesn't seem there's anything to challenge it before the Supreme Court. And your prediction is? 
<laughs> I long ago learned that he who lives by the crystal ball has to learn to eat ground glass. Um, when my grandmother was alive and she'd see a pregnant woman, she'd always guess as to the sex of the coming baby. And if she got it right, she'd never let you hear the end of it. And she got it wrong, she'd never mention it again. <laughs> I think the Supreme Court is not going to dismiss the case. I think what they're going to say is that the D.C. Circuit was wrong in invalidating the Trump plan, and I think they're going to send it back to the D.C. Circuit. I don't think it's going to be the case where it's a major change in administrative law. So certainly the briefing would allow it. If you look at the briefs that were filed in the court, um, there's a brief by the Cato Institute, there's a brief by the Claremont Institute that are asking the Supreme Court to take this and overrule 80 years of jurisprudence. I don't think the court's going to use this as the case to do that. But I don't think they're going to dismiss it either. I hope they do. Um, I'm very curious about the Texas abortion statute. Sure. Uh, where there's this attempt to sort of enlist private right of action sure. to enforce it. And I know Governor Newsom's very excited about this with, uh, with uh, gun control in California. What, what can you tell us about that? Sure. And is this new? The Texas law is unusual because it's not enforced by the attorney general of the state or by district attorneys. It's enforced by civil suits. It authorizes a civil suit against anyone who performs or, quote, aids or abets an abortion. And the issue before the Supreme Court was, can there be a suit against government officials to enjoin an unconstitutional law if they play no role in enforcing the law? The state itself can't be named as a defendant. States can't be sued because they have sovereign immunity, protection by the 11th Amendment. But can you sue a state officer if the state officer plays no role in enforcing the law? And the Supreme Court, in a case called Whole Woman's Health versus Jackson, in December of 2021, said state officers can't be sued if they play no role in enforcing the law. So if it's just a civil suit being authorized by the statute, you can't sue any government official to enjoin the law. Now, if somebody is sued under that law, they can argue as a defense that the law is unconstitutional. So if a doctor is sued, or somebody, the Uber driver who brings the woman to the clinic is sued, the defendant can argue the law is unconstitutional. But you can't go to court and get an injunction against government officials if they don't play a role in enforcing the law. Well, Governor Newsom has then said, okay, we should create civil liability for gun owners. Or there's a proposal in one state they would create civil liability for anyone who performs a same-sex wedding. Even though there's a right to same-sex weddings, if you create civil liability for the exercise of rights, why not that? Or why couldn't a state adopt a law that says civil liability for anybody who criticized the governor or state legislators? You have the right to do so, but you won't be able to go to court if all the law does is authorize civil liability. Interestingly, to go to the earlier question, the Supreme Court decision, Home and South Jackson, was five to four. The five in the majority, and it was an opinion of the court, was Thomas, Alito, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett. Roberts dissented, along with Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan. Is this new, you end by asking? No, though it's rare. There was a Fifth Circuit case in 2001. It was an en banc decision called Okbelobi versus Foster. And what it involved was a Louisiana law that created civil liability for doctors who performed abortions. It didn't prohibit abortion, but it created civil liability in all sorts of different ways. And a lawsuit was brought, and the Fifth Circuit on Bank said, if government officials don't play a role in enforcing the law, you can't sue them for an injunction. And it was that case, I think, that 20 years later becomes the inspiration for the Texas law which is now, just last week, Idaho adopted a law identical to the Texas law with regard to abortion. So we're gonna see a lot of these statutes and they're not gonna be limited to abortion. So it was upheld, but there's still a possibility that the, the uh, defendant can argue uh, yes. unconstitutionality of the statute? Yes. All the case is about is, can a government official be sued for an injunction if the government official plays no role in enforcing the law? But that doesn't make the law constitutional. Right. The Texas law is still unconstitutional. 
And a doctor who sued for violating it can argue as a defense that it's unconstitutional. But of course that takes a doctor courageous enough to violate the law and risk liability. And what we know is in Texas, most facilities closed rather than risk liability. And I mean, the Texas law is a $10,000 fine. What if it's a $100,000 fine or a million dollar fine? Even less that somebody's gonna take a risk and violate the law. So I'm very troubled apart from abortion of having states being able to adopt blatantly unconstitutional laws and then say, well, since we don't play a role in enforcing, it's just civil suits. I oppose the Gavin Newsom law. I think it's a really bad idea to go down this path, whether it's for things that I like or dislike. I, I think it's a really bad path. Thank you. It reminds me a little bit of I, how long it takes to undo these. Right. Um, it, you know, Kansas City was the home of uh, private real estate statements that prohibited selling your house to a person of color, racially restrictive covenants. Those were invented here in Kansas City. You all probably still have a deed that somewhere in it has a racially restricted covenant. It takes a long time to undo that when the path is so indirect to, to that. So uh, uh, yeah, it's, there's, some of this is really frightening um, if, if we say turnabout's fair play. Thank you for coming tonight. Can you? Thank you for having me. Pull it down there. Yeah, there you go. No way. Yeah. <laughs> One of these things. There you Thank go. Thank you. Man. Okay, this is good. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I, I have two questions. Um, I'll give you one at a time. And my first question regards Texas. I am not a student of the law. I'm immensely interested in the law, but um, so it's a real mundane question. What I didn't understand, and the media hasn't been answering for me, is if you have no standing to sue and you're not harmed by somebody giving an abortion or giving abortion advice in Texas, what gives you the right to sue? Sure. Can you explain that? <laughs> it's important to separate standing to sue in a federal court from standing to sue in a state court. In federal court, the Constitution says you must have standing to sue, and Congress can't override that. You can't get it by consent. And in order to sue in federal court, you've got to be personally injured. The injury has to be caused by the defendant. A favorable court decision has to remedy the injury. That's in federal court. But states get to decide their own standing rules. States don't have to follow the federal Constitution. And if a state legislature wants to authorize standing and the state constitution permits it, the state can do that even though there wouldn't be standing in federal court. So under Texas law, the state legislature could authorize anyone to sue a doctor who performs an abortion, anyone who aids or abets an abortion, even though that would never be allowed in federal court. That's because each state gets to decide its own standing rules for state courts. Okay. Thank you. The other question, looking back rather than forward, is on Citizens United. Sure. Could you comment on that? And it seems to me to say that one has as much free speech as one can afford to buy. And I just would like your opinion. Sure. As I think everyone here knows, Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission was a Supreme Court decision in 2010. It said that corporations have the right under the First Amendment to spend unlimited amounts of money under corporate treasuries to get candidates elected or to get candidates defeated. Seven years earlier, in McConnell versus Federal Election Commission, the Supreme Court came to the opposite conclusion. And then the court in Citizens United explicitly overrules McConnell. What changed in the seven years? Did the court find some musty history of the First Amendment that led it to believe it made a mistake? No, the difference was that Justice O'Connor had been in the majority in upholding the Bipartisan Campaign Finance Reform Act. And then Justice Alito replaced her, joins with, with the centers to overrule that decision. I was talking about what's judicial activism. I mean, think about it in this context of Citizens United. The court strikes down a federal statute, the McCain-Feingold Bipartisan Campaign Finance Reform Act. The court overrules a seven-year-old precedent 
And the court does so in a very broad way, saying that corporations have the right to spend unlimited amounts of money from corporate treasuries, can it's elected or defeated. Justice Ginsburg gave a speech not that long after in San Diego, which said, history regards Citizens United as one of the worst decisions of the Supreme Court. Now, I don't think Citizens United matters very much for presidential elections. When you're dealing with all of the money that's there, I don't think corporate expenditures are decisive. But a lot of political science studies have been done that where Citizens United has a huge effect is much more local elections, where advertising to get name recognition is really crucial, and where corporate spending does make a great difference. Um, Citizens United was five to four. It was split exactly along ideological lines, the five conservative just the majority, the four liberal justices in dissent. And given that the court has only become more conservative since, I don't see any likelihood that the court in the foreseeable future is going to reconsider Citizens United. Will you comment on the prospect of adding seats to the Supreme Court? Sure. The number of Supreme Court justices is not set by the Constitution. It's set by statute. It's varied from five to 10 over the course of American history. It was five at the very beginning of American history. Then as the country expanded, they would add a new justice for the additional territory to be the justice responsible for that area. And it got up to 10. Hard to imagine they actually chose to have an even number of justices. Nine is a historic accident. As you know, in the late 1860s, there was a terribly unpopular president, Andrew Johnson. He had been impeached by the House of Representatives. Congress did not want Andrew Johnson to pick someone for the Supreme Court. So it said the next time there is a vacancy on the court, we will eliminate that seat. And it went from 10 to 9. And it's been 9 ever since. There was a serious proposal by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1937 to expand the size of the Supreme Court. But as I mentioned in my introduction, in two cases in March and April of 1907, the Supreme Court abruptly shifted course, overruled 40 years of precedent, and it wasn't necessary to consider whether to expand the size of the Supreme Court. There are proposals to do so now, but the reality is there's no way they're gonna be adopted because in order to change the size of the Supreme Court, it would have to be a bill that would pass both the House and the Senate. The House might do so, but Republicans would filibuster it in the Senate. And we know that there's at least two Democratic senators of the 50 who won't change the rules with regard to the filibuster. So we can talk about whether it would be good or bad to expand the size of the Supreme Court, and I can see the arguments on both sides, but it's just not gonna happen. Now, now, I'll go back to an earlier question. Might there be a point where the court's legitimacy is so lost, where the court is seen as so out of touch that it becomes plausible? Sure, but not in the foreseeable future, I don't think. Okay, we're gonna take two more questions. And um, so, go ahead. Sure. Good evening. Uh, I've long thought that one of the advantages of originalism is, as dishonest as it is, it's easy to explain in a sound bite. Yes. Like lock her up and build a wall, you can get it in in 20 seconds and people believe they know what you're talking about. So my question for you is, do you have a catchy uh, description <laughs> of your alternative to originalism? No, but I'd love to come up with one. <laughs> you know, we're gonna hear so much this week. We already heard it today about, we want justices to follow the original meaning of the Constitution. And that sounds so appealing until you think, as I said tonight, that then Brown versus Board of Education was wrongly decided. Then affirmative action should be allowed. And you can go on with all of the other examples, and I can give many. But do I have a catchy way of describing it? No. But if you have one, I'm glad to help you publicize it. Okay. <laughs> Perhaps we can come up with that. Sir. Uh, thank you, yes. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, a quick comment and then a question. Uh, to me, uh, my cynical, very simplified looking at the doctrine of originalism is that it seems to be always a way to protect the interests of the rich, the wealthy, the corporate, the politically powerful, uh, just bottom line. 
but uh, and my question is can you name a case in which originalism was used and the decision as a result protected the rights of some minority or consumer or the environment or labor or defendants in criminal cases it sounds like a jeopardy question <laughs> ding 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 <laughs> Um, I can come up with an example where the justice used original to protect the rights of criminal defendants. That's the first that comes to mind. Wilson versus Arkansas in 1995. It said that the police have to knock and announce before they enter a dwelling, um, subject to exceptions. And Justice Thomas wrote that opinion very much in originalist terms. Um, uh, there were two cases last term in the Supreme Court involving the Fourth Amendment um, that in both of them, the Supreme Court looked to the laws that existed in 1791 in determining the scope of the Fourth Amendment today. Um, so I can come up with examples of that, but I can also come up with lots of examples where if you really follow originalism, it would lead to very frightening results in terms of the meaning of the Constitution. Um, I'll give an example here, since I'm talking about the Fourth Amendment. Should the police need a warrant before they access cellular location information? Or should the police need a warrant before they do wiretapping if it doesn't involve a physical trespass onto somebody's property? The Supreme Court back in 1928, Olmstead versus United States said, unless the police physically trespass, then there's no need to get a warrant. So if they can tap your phone without going into your house, they can listen to all your conversations. If they can get your cellular location information from the phone company. They don't trespass, it's okay. Now the Supreme Court abandons that, but Justices Thomas and Gorsuch in their dissent, being originalists, in Carpenter versus United States in 2018 said, if there's no physical trespass, it's not a search and it doesn't require a warrant. Um, maybe my best answer to your question is, inevitably, all of the justices have tremendous discretion. The text of the Constitution is unclear. The original meaning is unknowable. Constitutional law so often involves balancing of competing interests. So justices can come to the conclusions that they think is right. Originalism is just how conservative justices write their opinions. But I don't think if there was no such thing as originalism, they would come to any different conclusions. Um, and, you know. Some of you are lawyers. The first thing I want to know when I'm arguing a case in a court of appeal is who's my panel? Because I know that based on the identity of the judges and the case I argue, that's going to determine how likely it is I'm to win or lose. I've seen sometimes panels where I say, unless I really mess up, I'm going to win this case. And I've seen panels where I look and I go, I can let my puppy argue this case and I have no chance of winning. <laughs> that's because judges, especially in the kinds of cases that come to the Supreme Court, have tremendous discretion. It always has been and always will be that way. Please join me in th giving an enthusiastic thank you to our thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for coming out this evening. Be dry, be safe, and uh, please be sure to check out the future Cock Fair Chair classes and lectures. <laughs>